Hey guys, welcome to the second video uh, for the data visualization of our audio data. So in this video, we're going to be going over, uh, we're actually going to be plotting the our signals in the time domain, the frequency domain. Uh, we'll take a look at their filter bank energies and their mel frequency septal coefficients. Uh, so first thing to do, uh, just to get started, go ahead and open up where you originally downloaded the GitHub repository where your data is. And we're going to create two empty directories that we're going to need going on going forward. And so uh, the first directory will be called samples. And I'll make another one called clean. Really, you can call them whenever you want, but that's what I'm going to call them. And uh, let's also set up. So as we read in, what we're doing here is we're, we're just getting one example file for each of our classes, of our, our 10 classes. And we would like to plot those later on. So in order to store that data, uh, we're going to have four dictionaries. So uh, one dictionary will be called signals. The other one's going to be called FFT. Uh, let's do an F bank for the filter bank energies. And then we'll call it MFCCs will be our fourth dictionary. And uh, well, we just read in one signal. So let's go ahead and store it. So we'll say uh, signals of C is equal to signal. And uh, we can also grab the FFT. So the FFT of C is equal to, now we have to make a function and we'll call it um, calc FFT. So in order to calculate the FFT, we'll have to pass it the signal. And then we'll also have to pass the, the sampling rate for that signal. Um, the reason for this, when you calculate the FFT, uh, it is assumed that there is a very um, discrete amount of time that happens between each signal and it's consistent uh, all the time. Uh, so in order to generate a lot of the stuff, we, we need to know what the spacing is for each of our individual data points. So now let's first, uh, let's just make the function. So we'll go up here and uh, we'll make our calc FFT function. And what you need to pass this is our signal, we'll just call it Y, and our rate that we gave it before. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take the length of Y, we'll store that as N. And so, so the FFT has two parts. Uh, if you remember, we had like the magnitude phase that we're going to need to graph, and then we also have the frequency component. Uh, so NumPy has a really good implementation of this already so we can just do a couple function calls uh, we'll do numpy.fft and then we can extend that to uh, something that's called like the real fft um, and so if we want to get the the frequency values that our fft magnitudes have to fall within we can do our fft frequency and we need to give it the length of our signal and we also need to give it the the spacing between all of these individual samples. So uh, D is actually just equal to the inverse of our rate. So those are the, the amount of time that passes between each sample. And that'll generate a, a nice frequency component for us. So we'll just call that frequency. And then we'll also create the magnitude. So um, when, you, when you actually calculate the FFT, it returns a complex number. So it has a real part and an imaginary part. In order to get the magnitude, uh, what we do, if you remember how to take the, the magnitude of like a complex number, you just take the absolute value, which uh, what ends up happening is it takes the, the sum of squares of the two components, the, the magnitude and the imaginary part, like the real and the imaginary. So we're gonna take the absolute value of numpy.fft, and it's gonna be the same as before, but it's just rfft. Um, so we'll just pass our whole signal in there. And uh, the next thing, uh, technically, we don't need to do this because we're going to guarantee that all of our data in the future is going to be the same length. But uh, a good thing to do is like what's called mean normal. Like we have to normalize for the length of the signal. So what we end up doing is we divide this by N so that this magnitude is scaled appropriately based on like the length of the signal. Like if you think about it, if you pass a larger signal into the FFT, 
there's going to be more potential for energy to kind of fit into those frequency bins. So in order to balance that based on this, like the length of the signal, you have to divide by n. Okay, and then we're just going to return a tuple, and it's going to be our magnitude and then our frequency component. So this is our calc FFT uh, method. Okay, and so uh, that should be good. Actually, we can probably just try plotting this stuff as is, and now we'll, we'll plot it later. Um, let's just go ahead and create the uh, the F bank. So uh, the filter bank coefficients, and I guess what I'll do is I'll say uh, bank is equal to log F bank. So if you remember, our filter banks are going to be scaled with log f bank and, and this function comes from now we're going to be using from python speech features we'll be using the mfcc and the log f bank so if you come down here uh, if you remember the filter bank and i guess the way we're going to do this just to make it uh, realistic we're going to take our signal and i only want to show like the one second of data instead of showing the entire signal uh, but i only want to look at one one second I'll have to give it the collection rate. And let's also give it the number of filters. So uh, the number of filters we're gonna be using, if you remember from the previous lecture, um, the, the standard is 26. And then we also have to come up with this NFFT number. Um, so what is NFFT? Uh, if you remember, we had a, a window size of 25 milliseconds. So this is what it's actually asking. Let me pull up the calculator. Uh, if you take one second and you divide it by 40, you get this 25 millisecond component. Um, this is what it's alluding to. It, it needs to know what, how many points are going to fall in my FFT for cal like how much I should allot to calculate the FFT. Um, that should just be equal to the window length when you're doing the short time Fourier transform. Um, so the way you get this is, uh, if you remember our sampling frequency was 44,100, divide that by 40, and you, you wind up with this decimal. So uh, the number of FFT is going to be 1,103. And so what happens when it computes that, it's going to put like some zeros onto uh, to pad out the rest of that window to match some kind of like power of two when it actually computes the FFT. Okay. Um, and the other thing, because of the way it returns this matrix, we have to take the transpose of it um, just to make sure everything's gonna plot well. So let's store that calculation. So we'll say F bank of C is equal to bank. That's good. Um, so now let's actually calculate our our MFCC values. So we'll do MFCC, and it's very similar to the filter bank function call. Uh, we'll just do our signal from for one second at this collection rate, and uh, the arguments are a little bit different. We're going to have to tell it the number of septrals that we want. Uh, so the number of septrals is going to be the number of septrals that we keep um, from the after doing the discrete cosine transform on our our filter bank energies. So our number of septrals uh, typically we throw away half of um, the the redundant ones. So we'll just set this to thirteen, and we have to set our number of filters again. So twenty six. Like you could keep all twenty six if you wanted to. Um, and we'll, we'll probably give some examples of changing these parameters, but NFFT is again going to be equal to 1103. And we'll take the transpose again. And we'll say MFCCs of C is equal to MEL. And now we can start graphing. So uh, let's do plot signals of signals plt dot show and we're just gonna be doing this for for everything so plot FFT pass it FFT plt dot show uh, plot F bank 
asset f bank plt.show and plot mfcc's mfcc's plt.show uh, so what we should be left with actually this should graph hopefully cool so let me just talk briefly about this these are all our graphs let's start looking at the time series so we've got our 10 different classes um, the, we've already seen these before from the first lecture the only thing I'm going to emphasize here is uh, notice like within flute look at all this empty like really low magnitude portion of the signal uh, we want to actually get rid of this because this is very ambiguous like if you look at acoustic guitar bass drum all these signals die out and the magnitude gets really low and so to an algorithm when it starts to see this there's there's hardly any signal there um, so we can do a little bit of filtering um, or rather like basically it's called like noise threshold detection so you figure out like what is the lowest theoretical uh, value this microphone could be reading and i want to just check like if any values are below that i'll just remove it and so basically you're just doing um a computation to get rid of this dead space in audio uh, but let's look at our fourier transforms these aren't very um uh, they, they don't mean a lot <laughs> they don't look like you can't really tell in like hi-hat and snare drum uh, the the frequencies are distributed so across the spectrum that you can't really tell so even then like if you just take a look at the FFT you you still wouldn't be able to tell what all these instruments are but um, once we start to uh, create our filter bank energies then we start to see something happening and this is what our filter bank energies look like you can actually see the the temporal relationships in the individual values uh, which looks good but uh, the final part is doing the discrete cosine transform that we talked about before and now uh, we get what we looked like what we saw um, with the powerpoint slides everything starts to look very unique like you would be able to look at these you'd probably be able to tell them all apart and you kind of get rid of that time relationship within the data uh, but at this point we need to we need to talk about how to get rid of this dead space in the audio so let's do that now because this is important um, and this is kind of tricky but what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what's called the envelope of a signal so the envelope actually let's just start making a function to do it we'll call it uh, def envelope of uh, so the way, we, what, way we're going to do this is we're going to pass it a signal y, we'll give it a uh, collection rate, and then we'll also give it uh, a threshold, okay? And what we're going to be trying to do, let me actually search this really quick, uh, signal envelope. This is what a, a single envelope looks like, like right here. You can see this red line above. This is what we want to detect. We want to get like an estimation for that magnitude to see if it's fallen. Like if it's fallen too low, then we'll just consider that the audio has died out and it's not important, okay? So that's what we're, we're doing with the signal envelope. All right, and that's what that threshold's gonna be. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to construct a mask. Uh, so NumPy will support Boolean indexing, so we can just create a mask of like true false values that we can uh, use to like reduce and remove uh, those empty kind of portions of the data. Um, so the easiest way to do this is we will create a series. Uh, so we're going to do pd.series. We can pass our signal y into, so it's a numpy, right? We're going to convert it to a series. Um, and so now that our data is in a series, we can do dot apply. Uh, so this is just like using map. Um, you just want to apply a function. So we're going to take the absolute value because this signal, it goes, it's negative a lot of the time. We want to just create the absolute value of that. Okay. And then um, in addition to moving all of it into like an absolute value kind of situation, 
uh, we're gonna do a y dot rolling. So this is another like this is also the reason why we converted it to a series because um, pandas series can create. This is the easiest way to do a rolling window over your data. So you don't want to just look at like one value and check it you want to check like ideally like a, a rolling window that goes over and you want to check like the mean of all those values to see if like the entire signal is actually dropped out because um if you just do one value then it's gonna there's gonna be lots of values that because it crosses the x-axis so frequently um, lots of values are gonna get removed and your data is going to be completely ruined so we're going to create a rolling window so uh, the window is going to be equal to, uh, now I just made it a tenth of our collection rate. So every tenth of a second. So our window size is going to be a tenth of a second. And uh, we'll have to pass it like what's called min periods. This is the, the minimum number of values that we need in our window to create a calculation. Uh, because if not, you'll get a bunch of like, imagine you start the window and it's going to be centered, okay? From the first value it's going to look to the left it's not going to see anything in that array um, and it would it would generally just return a bunch of like nans and we don't want that so that's what min periods is going to do and we can say center equals true and then uh, so, so as we move this like window across the signal we're going to take the mean of it okay it's getting messy but okay so now we've created like an aggregated mean of all those values that are in that window as we pass it along the signal. And we wanna say like for mean in y mean, uh, if that mean is greater than our threshold value, and we'll, we have to figure out what this threshold's gonna be, I'll uh, we'll just do mass.append true, and else we'll just say mass.append uh, false, okay? And we can return the mask. So uh, that's our envelope function. And now we can go down here and we can actually create the envelope of the signal. Um, so before we assign the signal into our, our plotting, like for plotting, we can run the, the envelope function on it. Actually, okay, I had to return the mask. So let's just say like mask is equal to um, envelope of our signal collected at this rate and the threshold you can play around with the threshold um, but because Labrosa kind of converts the data it's this really weird small value it's I found 0 0.005 to work you can just like mess around with this to see what works for you but that's just what I'm gonna use as the threshold uh, and that'll create a mask and let's say, let's just reassign signal. So let's say signal is equal to signal and it's gonna be indexed with this mask. Um, that looks good. So let's go ahead and run that. Hopefully that works. Cool, I look good. So now notice that um, if we look up, we have all this dead space and flute. Uh, we've got some dead face and like snare drum. Uh, you could argue like some at double bass, some at acoustic guitar. But now it's totally gone. And we get this nice audio where everything, everything in the audio signal is as relevant as it can possibly be based on that threshold that we we set over here. Okay. And so that's how you do um, noise floor detection of a signal, which is really important. And you can also start to see we have like a clear implementation of all of our functions that we're going to be using later for modeling. Okay. And so uh, the last part is we we need to go ahead and uh, we're going to I mentioned earlier we're going to be downsampling our audio and we're also going to be um, we need to put that mask over our audio. So this is like this is why we created this clean directory we want to take everything from wave files clean all those up based on this noise floor detection and our downsampling and then store it into the clean directory and that's what we'll be using for our actual modeling okay so this is pretty simple uh, we'll say if the length of 
os.list directory. And so we'll look at our clean directory. And if that is empty, then we'll say, okay, 4f in tqdm. So this is again, <laughs> we finally got to use tqdm. Uh, we'll take uh, data frame dot file name. So we're going to go through all of our uh, available file names and uh, we want to take a look and we want to load our signals. So we'll use Librosa again. We'll say signal rate is equal to Librosa dot load. So it'll be wave files uh, plus F. And our sampling rate's going to be, we're actually going to downsample to 16,000. Let me move this back. All right, we're going to downsample to 16,000. And I, I already talked about dance, downsampling before, but it's the idea that we don't have a lot of stuff in our high frequency range. So we can just discard it and create like more compact data via downsampling. Um, and so again, let's create our mask using the envelope function and we'll pass it the same stuff that we did before signal rate and 0 0.005 so that'll get rid of our dead spots in the audio and then we just want to do a wave file dot write and we want to write where uh, the arguments for this are like file name equals um, and what we'll do is we'll put it in the clean directory but we'll also add on our file name and we'll say rate is equal to rate and data is equal to our signal but we're going to boolean index it with that mask so what should happen now I'm going to go ahead and run it so what you should have happening is and this is why we're using tqdm you can watch this little progress bar go forward um, and if we just look at it, it's generating all these audio files in clean. And so now we're going to have 300 cleaned audio files uh, that will be ready for modeling. So um, that should pretty much cover all of the, the pre-processing for our audio. I know I kind of rushed through a lot of this, but hopefully I explained it well enough. Like if you're confused by stuff and want to work through it yourself, then pause the video. But um, in the next part, we're actually getting into the fun stuff, which is uh, the modeling of all this audio that we just cleaned. So I uh, hope to see you there.